So we are going to start the conference by taking a look at the situation of DAOs in Switzerland. Even if DAOs are still not very visible in our country, they are well and truly present. As we will discover in the company of four lawyers who have already helped to create DAOs or have already encountered DAOs in their legal practice. So it's my pleasure to introduce the moderator of the panel on DAOs in Switzerland, mm -hmm. Professor Rolf Weber. Professor Weber is a professor of international business law at the University of Zurich. His academic endeavors extends to co-directing both the Center for Information Technology, Society and Law and the Blockchain Center. Beyond academia, Professor Weber holds the position of an attorney at law in Zurich, offering advice in areas ranging from international trade and finance and antitrust law to the intricate world of internet and blockchain. He's the author of numerous publications in these fields. He's also an arbitrator and a board member for the Swiss Blockchain Federation. Furthermore, Professor Weber was expert at the Swiss government for the new Distributed Ledger Technology Act, the so-called Swiss DLT Act. With such extensive experience, we are indeed fortunate to have Professor Weber steer our discussion today. Rolf, I thank you very much for agreeing to moderate this panel. The floor is yours. Thank you uh, very much, uh, Professor Guillaume Florence, for this very kind uh, introduction. Um, in fact, my merits uh, do not really play now a role for this uh, first panel, because we do have three excellent presenters giving insight into the DAOs in Switzerland. Therefore, I would uh, like to invite you uh, to thoroughly follow the three uh, presentations uh, which now will be uh, given. I think the fact uh, that we do speak about DAOs in uh, Switzerland at the very beginning of this prestigious uh, conference nicely uh, builds a bridge to the presentation, to the inaugural presentation, which has been uh, given by the president of the uh, Neuchatel uh, Cantonal Council, referring to the innovative forces in uh, Neuchatel for centuries uh, in the watch uh, industry, in, insofar as architecture um, is uh, concerned, and also to the new developments in the blockchain uh, business uh, fields. Switzerland always uh, including the financial markets, has tried to be innovative, to offer a good environment for uh, new uh, businesses. And in principle, this uh, uh, also is uh, true for the crypto uh, business uh, models. We talk now about uh, DAOs, and I'm uh, not going to uh, say uh, not so nice uh, words about the most recent uh, practice of FINMA in uh, other fields of the uh, crypto uh, business. And without further ado, I would like to uh, invite the first uh, speaker to come to the stage. The first uh, speaker is Libun uh, Mehvetai, attorney uh, uh, of law based in uh, Geneva, partner of um, Walter Wies. Uh, 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 Libon uh, Mehmetai, welcome. Has uh, experienced the education at the University of uh, Fribourg, so relatively uh, close to Neuchâtel, and then uh, got an LLM from University of California, Los Angeles. His practice primarily revolves around regulatory aspects in banking and finance law, with a strong emphasis on blockchain uh, technologies, and uh, very obviously, he offers uh, his uh, legal advice to uh, crypto-oriented uh, firms. Let me make the additional remark that uh, we do have three presentations, and in order to save time for all three speakers, 
I would like to invite you to note down your questions which you do have to this uh, first presentation, and then we do have another 15, maybe even 20 minutes for discussion at the end. So uh, the floor um, is uh, yours uh, for the presentation, why those decide to be in Switzerland. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Weber. It's a pleasure seeing you all, and thank you to Professor Guillaume for this um, very interesting event. So, I work as a lawyer, um, but today is not really a legal topic, or it is a, a little bit for me, but lawyers also do pitches and promote Switzerland. That's what we do all the time. Our clients come to see us, and they say, well, why should we come to Switzerland? So. Uh, this meme that you see here has been sent to me by a client. Um, he told me, why Switzerland? Why not Wyoming? What should we do? And, and that's uh, I, where I got the inspiration for this presentation because I really had to pitch Switzerland. So I'm not as good as, um, as Mr. Ribot, who whose speech was quite incredible when you think about it. He said, come to Neuchâtel, we will offer you everything. That's, that's pretty impressive, um, and it tells a, a lot about the Swiss mindset. So here's my remote. So let's start. We have only 15 minutes, so it will be uh, pretty short. We have five categories of reasons. The first one is regulatory and, and, and legal. We'll speak about it. Um, economic factors, of course, those are often uh, decisive in, the, in deciding on the jurisdiction. Infrastructure, ecosystems, we'll speak about it a lot today, I think. And we heard Mr. Ribot about this uh, ecosystem in Neuchâtel, which is very important, uh, especially for DAOs. A few words about political and cultural factors in Switzerland, which I, I think make Switzerland a great fit for DAOs. And the last reason I don't have slides about it is a Swiss reputation. I mean, the, it's, it's quite obvious, right? When you say something is Swiss, it always sounds nice, uh, and, it, and it actually is. And the lack of al alternatives, there are a few jurisdictions in the world um, that have made um, Im improvements or have prepared the ground for DAOs. Wyoming is one of them. We have Estonia, Malta, and a lot of offshore jurisdictions as well. Um, but yeah, we will not talk about it, we'll just focus on, on Switzerland and we'll mention only the positive aspects. So, regulatory and legal. So the regulatory environment in Switzerland is quite good, I would not say perfect, but as compared to other jurisdictions, um, it, is, it is quite friendly to innovation and um, we, especially now, if you, if you look at the, what is happening in the blockchain industry and, and the regulatory environment in the world, you see the US uh, regulating by enforcement, you see the EU who has really dense regulations about everything, for example with, with Mika, um, and Switzerland is here without not too much regulation, very principle-based uh, laws and leaves room for interpretation, which is Always, always good for, for innovation, I think. The DLT Act. So 2020, Switzerland made this big change and it was a big innovation with the DLT Act when, and I think now it's quite obvious for us, but it, it, is, a, it is a huge change to be able to say that in a country like Switzerland with a very old, very old laws, you are able to tokenize shares of the company and if you have a token, you are in the same position as you, if you have shares. And this has attracted a lot of companies. I always ask my clients, why did you come to Switzerland in the blockchain space? And most 50% of the time or more, it's, it's because of this, because of the DLT Act. So I think this might play a big role also for DAOs. FINMA, I hesitated to put it on the list, to be honest, because it's sometimes very good, sometimes a bit, a, a, a bit strange, but um, no, seriously, Th FINMA is, is, is a regulator and it makes um, its decision, but what is great in Switzerland is you can really approach the regulator, you can ask questions, you can prepare your case and validate it before you start. So you will, if you do things properly, 
with good legal advice, uh, you, you should not face any surprises uh, like in the US when suddenly you launch a business and after five years it's, it's being shut down and everybody put in jail. Uh, so it's, we have this safety here and I think it, it's, it's a great factor for DAOs. Legal forms available, my colleagues will speak about it, so um, I, I think the Swiss legal framework now has a few legal forms that can be attractive to DAOs, there is the association, the foundation. We even have some leeway for certain form of DAOs in, the, in, in our corporate structures, uh, which is still being explored right now, but I think the current legal fr framework is interesting, uh, and we will talk, I think, tomorrow um, uh, about whether we, we need some changes in, the, in Swiss law to develop DAOs more. We also have in Switzerland something that people don't really know, but we have a great tradition of unincorporated businesses. I mean, we have firms in Switzerland, for example, law firms with 500 or more employees in Switzerland who are not incorporated, who are not registered in the Swiss Commercial Register, and that operates freely without any problems. So just that, in, in, if you look at the tradition, if, if you say it's possible to, to build such structures uh, without any incorporation, well, it's, it's pretty much a good sign for DAOs. Uh, no physical presence requirements as compared to, to, to certain jurisdictions when you really need substance, you need to have people on the ground. In Switzerland, it's quite easy to operate without uh, real presence. So you, you need to have some corporate directors here, but except from that, you can, you can operate a business and just register it in Switzerland, and that's what actually most people do, even startups. Um, in Switzerland. And last aspects, legal security uh, and principle-based legislation, I already mentioned that, but if you look at Swiss law, everything is principle-based. So we have these big principles and the details will leave it to interpretation. And that, uh, th that is, a, is a key factor, especially for new forms or, or for innovation like, like DAOs. Legal security, of course, is not yet there for DAOs. I mean, uh, we all have read um, the, the, the excellent research made namely by, by the Lextech uh, Institute. We are starting to have some clarifications, but we are not there yet. But thanks to the, to, to the Swiss principle-based system, we are able to operate and DAOs are already able uh, to come to Switzerland and, and, and create their structures. Economic factors, low taxes, even in Neuchâtel, yes. Um, taxes are pretty low as compared to other jurisdictions, which is always a very important factor. And it was mentioned earlier as well uh, by Professor Guillaume, tax predictability. If you come to Switzerland, you go and you speak with the lawyers, they prepare a tax ruling. That's always how it works. And you go and you can speak to the tax administration. You can negotiate, you can say this is tax, this is not. Uh, you can discuss everything and then have predictability, which is really important. And with many crypto companies in, in Switzerland or, or active in the blockchain space, um, tax authorities actually understand the business. It's not always easy, you have to explain to them a lot of things, but they still understand that, and you're able to, to, to navigate through those very complex rules and to reach outcomes which are um, quite, quite good and acceptable for, for clients. Then flexible cross-border services as well. A lot of companies are created in Switzerland. You are able to operate from Switzerland anywhere in the world. We don't have restrictions like other countries um, on, on cross-border services. There are only a few of them. Stable economy, that's obvious as well, but if you want to operate uh, any, any type of, of business or project, you need a stable economy, and Switzerland has one. I think that's, um, that's what I think, even if we do bank, bank mergers on Sundays. Otherwise, it's, it's quite stable. Um, Business-friendly environment, you heard Mr. Ribot. I, I think his speech was quite incredible. Uh, it, it, he tells us, like, come, come with your DAO, come to Neuchâtel, come here. And this is, this is quite rare in the international space when you have politicians that say, just come here, you, you are welcome. Especially in the crypto space, it's, or blockchain space, it's, it's quite impressive and, and this is something which is really good, I think, and a good argument. Infrastructure. 
you have service providers, you have a real ecosystem that will benefit DAOs and, and blockchain companies. You have good lawyers here in the room, you have accountant, you have corporate directors, you have banks, you name it. Everybody here does blockchain. Um, the state, if you look at cantonal authorities like Neuchâtel, you see how open they are. And I think this m plays a big role uh, in deciding where to come. There are other players as well. I mean, DAOs, if they, they see that there are other DAOs in Switzerland or Neuchâtel or Geneva or Zug, um, they will say, well, these guys uh, have probably made a good decision. So it will attract other DAOs as well. Stable coins. I don't know if you, if you know that, but this year, two stable coins have been issued in Switzerland, approved by FINMA. So this is, this is quite huge, and I think that's one of the first ones in the world where a regulator has approved stable coin. So we are able uh, to prepare the next steps that are really needed for DAOs is to be able to, to, to do the payment parts as well and to bridge the gap between DAOs and the real world. So stable coins are really key and I think Switzerland is really playing a, a big role now. Uh, not a lot of people talk about it, but it's, it's, to me it's, it's a small revolution. Tokenization as well. I spoke about the DLT Act. In Switzerland the mindset is really tokenize the world. We are tokenizing everything. Um, and we have actors who, who actually are specialized in that, uh, which is quite unique, I think, uh, internationally. And this also is key to DAOs, the DAOs that want to interact with the we real world. You need tokenization for a transfer af of assets, and you need the payment part, and this is only done with, uh, with, with stable coins. Banking infrastructure in Switzerland, I mean, we all know that it is pretty strong, and we have banks that are crypto-friendly. Uh, they are not always easy to find, um, but they are. They, they are here and they operate and, uh, in, in, in Neuchâtel, in Geneva, Zug, Zurich, etc. The crypto hubs, you all know them. Neuchâtel, the biggest one, then Geneva, and a little one named Zug. I don't know if you know it. Um, but here you have really networks of, of companies, of service providers, of other firms, and this attracts, of course, new companies. Startup scene is really vibrant as well. Switzerland is not good to finance startups, but to create startups is, is one of the, the best ones. And in the last two minutes that I have, let's talk a bit about political and culture, cultural factors. Switzerland is home to democracy and we have a very unique democratic system, very horizontal, right? If you are not happy with a decision of the government or a law, you can just challenge it and everybody votes, and then you have a smart contract that includes that in the Constitution. Um, almost not. But to me, the system, the core system of DAOs, the philosophy around it, makes Switzerland a great fit for that, because it's in the Swiss DNA to have this horizontality. So it makes, uh, to, to me, a really fertile ground for DAOs. Political stability. Uh, in Switzerland, we are um, we are quite boring in terms of politics, which is great for business, right? Because nothing happens. Um, always the, 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 the same parties are there, so very stable, no surprises. Uh, geopolitically, it's a bit the same. We are invaded by startups, but not by foreign military forces, which also is a great thing for business. And then we have this, uh, and this principle, the technology neutral principle, is not really included anywhere in the laws, I think, um, but it's something that is commonly accepted now. In all new laws, in all regulations, we always see that, technology neutral. That means that if you come with an innovation, well, you shouldn't be punished just because you're using a new technology. So same business, same rules, even if you use technology. And then, um, eventually the privacy culture. We are a country for, and we hope it stays like that, but we will see because there are some legislative changes being, uh, being planned. Privacy, you can have a company in Switzerland and nobody knows that you're the owner, right? It seems like simple, but it's quite unique. 
uh, and everywhere in EU or, or in other countries, it's, it's being changed. And the AG, the SA, Société Anonyme, means literally anonymous company, right? So it's, it, it, I hope it's there to stay because this, um, the, for a lot of people active in the blockchain industry or in international business, this is a really important point. And we hope that, that this remains. So yeah, I think uh, uh, it's yeah, 15 minutes. I'm here for questions after uh, this conference. I'm here all day and tomorrow, so happy uh, to take your questions and discuss after that. Thank you very much. Well, uh, thank you very much for this uh, insightful presentations. In fact, I uh, do have uh, questions, and obviously I'm not going to raise the questions, but as an also French-speaking uh, Swiss-German person, obviously I need to question your geographical ranking, putting Zug at the end and forgetting about the Zurich uh, hub, but uh, that's another question. I would like to move now to uh, the second uh, speaker, and I kindly ask Florian Ducoma to come to the uh, stage. Uh, Florian uh, Ducoma got his education at the University of Lausanne, and then uh, he received an LLM degree at McGill in Montreal, uh, Canada. His doctoral thesis was on open license open licenses, and he continued this uh, type of study also in Montreal. In the meantime, uh, Florian Ducoma is an attorney uh, practicing um, in uh, the Lake of Geneva area. He is a partner of uh, Bona Lawson International law firm, having offices more or less around the world. And after we got the introduction into the house uh, environment in uh, Switzerland. We are going to hear more about governance uh, in the house, about regulatory uh, framework. The floor is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Weber. It's a great honor. Thank you very much also, uh, Professor Guillaume and uh, Dr. Riva for the invitation. Uh, really glad to be here today. And actually today, um, I'm going to talk to you more about on-chain governance than about DAOs. I'm gonna speak to you more about frameworks than about DAOs. So let's, let's look at, at what, what we are go going to go through today. Uh, regulatory framework, compliance framework, corporate framework and distribution, distributed governance framework. To start with the regula regulatory framework, <clears throat> um, basically rules that apply now to distributed and de 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 decentralized finance apply to DAO that generally uh, govern DeFi protocols. So we can look at what is the regulation applicable to DeFi and the trends that we can observe in the FINMA practice and in our private practice as lawyers to pretty much extend that to what is going to be ha apl applicable to DAOs. So in June, uh, FINMA had a round table uh, with some actors of the industry and uh, they published afterwards this, this paper that summarizes pretty much the regulatory approach uh, towards DeFi and towards dis decentralized frameworks, as I call them. So when no responsible person is there, the DeFi project are often characterized by opaque governance structures, which I guess refers a bit to DAOs, and insufficiently available information. Um, therefore, existing regulatory concept could be rendered ineffective due to lack of ide identifiable and intermediaries. Um, unclear territorial jurisdiction, interaction with financial actors, different kind of risks are highlighted by the regulators. So basically, this is a, the challenges that FINMA has highlighted in, in the last roundtable. 
The policy approach is always the same from FINMA. I think uh, my, my colleague before highlighted the tech neutrality, not always as neutral as that for crypto. If you look at AML regulation, it's not neutral. Um, crypto asset in banking, it's not neutral, but it's the principle. Substance over form, it's always like the same rule and same business, same risks rules are always the general principle that uh, FINMA will apply wh when looking at, uh, at a concrete case. So now the phenomenon of alleged, de alleged decentralization. Um, basically, what we can keep in mind is that FINMA will look at anchors, right? When you claim you are decentralized, then the regulator will look at the anchor points uh, that will actually make the project or the protocol not fully decentralized. And this is quite important because if you remember the philosophy, libertarian philosophy behind Bitcoin, the, the principle was that it should be fully decentralized. And, and when, when Ethereum Foundation came in and other protocols that use uh, the same framework, basically the, that introduced a centralized foundation or centralized authority to run the protocol. And, and now that's what the regulator is looking at, looking at who controls the development, the further development of the smart contracts, who holds the so-called governance tokens, is there a majority uh, held by some, some protagonist of the project, um, how do actually the smart contra contract function? Um, is, is it dependent on uh, the input on a single person? Um, and and they, they will assess the, well, the DeFi application uh, if it's only possible to actually use it through one specific person. And basically, if any income is paid by the protocol to a single person or entity, that will be a centralizing factor that will be uh, considered. So th these, these regulatory anchors are quite important when assessing a DAO or a DeFi project or any type of protocol. Then if, if there is a central, centralizing factor, uh, the regulator will apply basically the same type of approach that it would apply to a regulated business. Uh, clarification and information uh, are going to be requested by the, the project or the institutions that run the project or the people running the project. Um, and then if there's an application, an authorization required, they will need to apply. Um, they will need to go through an in-depth analysis uh, in terms of prudential status and uh, to, to carry out a regulatory analysis of the DeFi application in the targeted market. So I think these are principles that everyone should keep in mind uh, in this room when structuring decentralized autonomous organization or as I call them distributed governance frameworks uh, because actually there are pretty much in practice always anchor points. Uh, there's always people behind the project. There's always uh, starting, the project are always starting to be centralized and then like the decentralization occurs over time. There's always payment from the protocol to some, some wallets. And they, there must be somebody maintaining the protocol, maintaining the smart contract and giving the, the necessary inputs. So these, these factors are really important to keep in mind. Another factor uh, that could also be triggered by decentralized organizations is the Collective Investment Scheme Act um, that aims to protect investors, ensure transparency and proper functioning of the market for collective investment schemes. And actually, um, the, 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 the factors that qualify as a collective investment scheme are um, these factors, so asset composed of investors' contributions, a jointly managed investment, pooling, 
the, 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 for the purpose of return of a capital gain and a third party management of the asset. So if you have a smart contract that actually pools crypto asset and somebody behind the smart contract can control this, this, this smart contract and control the assets, then potentially you'll be, you'll be falling into uh, this, this category of uh, collective investment scheme. And, and, and even if you have oracles that can influence the smart contract, that could also be the case. So there are exceptions, and the exceptions are actually operating companies who, which are engaged in, in business activities, holding companies holding more than 51% of the, the underlying company, investment clubs, but that's limited to uh, 25, 30 per people uh, in a position to manage themselves, their positions, and associations and foundations under the Swiss Civil Code. If you are structured this way, you are under one of the exception of the Collective Investment, Investment Scheme Act, and you should be in a safe, safe place. So I just wanted to um, show you, my colleague just mentioned this, the structures that exist under the corporate framework now. There's a, there's a framework, there's a, a legal entity that we don't use enough, in my opinion, in this, in this sphere of, of decentralized organizations, is the cooperative. Because the, the cooperative is an exception to the Collective Investment scheme, scheme Act, it could have illimited number of partners uh, very easily. There's no capital requirement. Only seven people can form a cooperative. And the problem, in some, some extent, is that it cannot share the excedent on top of usual interest rates. So on top of 5%, it should be in the articles, and uh, it's difficult to pay back to the community members some, some returns. We have the commercial entities that are also, if they, have a, if they carry out a, a commercial activity, an exception to the Collective Investment Scheme Act, um, they can pay dividend pay, payment, but it's quite difficult in terms of flexibility because you need to deposit capital in a bank account, you need to manage, have a, you know, um, a director in Switzerland. So if you want to operate uh, in a decentralized way, it's, it has some, some, some burdens. The association in Switzerland can be um, also very easily set up. Uh, and, and many of the uh, DAOs that operate out of Switzerland use associations. Um, and, and now we need to register them at commercial register as soon as they have an international activity. But that's quite easy to set up. Uh, or foundations, which is a bit more complex. Also exceptions to the Collective Investment Scheme Act. And uh, limited partnership, which is not... Uh, as you know, a company, but a contract which is very flexible, um, adapted to distributed governance frameworks, actually. But there's no legal personality, and it's not an exception to the Collective Investment Scheme Act. So that, that's the risk of qualifying as a collective investment scheme, and there's no protection uh, with, the, with the legal uh, personality. So just wanted to go through uh, a very concrete use case. Uh, so we had different projects that wanted actually to structure as a DAO to onboard different mining pools in different countries. But they wanted uh, to have retail investors choose which pool they want to invest in, uh, one in Scandinavia, one in Paraguay, one in Switzerland. Uh, Switzerland with the price of energy was not the best one, but so the returns are different. And, uh, they didn't want to structure that as a company. They wanted to structure that as a DAO. So, and also they wanted to reward the people investing using the Bitcoin mind to reward them based also on the profit, depending on the energy price. So in your opinion, how do we structure uh, this, this, this DAO? Because if we go for uh, a limited company, it's, it's too heavy. 
um, we need to have one company in each country, uh, a limited company in Switzerland. It should be an operating company. That, that's possible. That's really like organizing mining as an industry. Uh, but then we need to have a, a, like the hash rate in the Swiss company to, be, to make it really like the, the, the commercial entity with an activity, not just a, an investment vehicle. If we go for um, cooperative, which was actually quite, in my opinion, a good uh, structure, because you could have one cooperative for every type of you know, uh, mining pro project. The problem was that you could not pay more than 5% returns to the invest investors. So if, if mining pools generate much more, which is generally what they target, um, it was a blocking point. Um, limited partnership, that's also an option. It's very flexible, but there's no protection under the Collective Investment Scheme, Scheme Act. So this use case is just to show you that depending on, on which structure you, you choose, you always encounter risks and other challenges, right? So there's no, at, the, at this time, maybe after, after this, these two days, you're going to come up with a new structure. But at the moment, each and every structure under Swiss law has some, some advantages and disadvantages and some risks. Um, compliance framework. Generally, Web3 people claim that Web3 and DeFi are not in line with co compliance and AML. Basically, that's what we hear you can't actually make a framework available because people don't use it and won't be able to onboard on, on our protocol. And I think also here we should be quite cautious <clears throat> because you might be familiar with this Article 4 uh, of the Ordinance on Banking and on um, Money Laundering. Um, and actually, this, this article is quite broad um, because every time and a financial intermediary assists in the transfer of virtual currencies to a third party, having a, a durable contractual relationship with this third party or with the client, then it could fall under the Anti-Money Laundering Act. And FINMA has a very broad approach and very broad interpretation of this clause. And this clause I mentioned is not technologically neutral because it applies to crypto assets. And actually, it's, um, it's, 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 it's an innovation because it's, okay, sorry. Uh, it's an innovation because the, the regulator um, has interpreted this, this clause in a way that you don't need to have a power of disposal over the asset. Even, even if you don't have a power of disposal of, over the asset, that could be triggered. So, that, that's to be, to be kept in mind when organizing uh, protocols. So ba basically you should ask yourself, is making available an on-chain voting interface or a protocol assisting in the transfer of virtual asset to a third party? In my opinion, no, to the extent there's a long, no long-term relationship with the contracting party. Potentially, if the organizers control the voting protocol by controlling the governance tokens or the smart contract that govern the, 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 the protocol. And yes, if the token are qualified as virtual currencies and there is a power of disposal on behalf of the contractual party. So some, some, some systems now use uh, ZK, so zero knowledge for compliance solutions in Web3 and uh, I think uh, this is not totally, uh, you know, ir irrelevant to consider uh, that, that this solution will be the way through. So let's go to the way forward, if you give me two minutes. Uh, so you see there's this uh, regulation that looks at centralized factors. So the way forward, in my opinion, is that you need to have in structuring DAOs real distribution of power, no dyno, so the, uh, decentralized in a name only. Um, 
no control over the underlying asset or the uh, liquidity pools, a proper distribution of uh, private keys, proper distribution of oracles, unchained votes, and rewards of votes in token to incentivize participation to the, the, the members. And that leads me to this transition from DAO to distributed governance framework, because we don't want to be decentralized, we want to be distributed, um, because it's not autonomous, it's on-chain governance, uh, it's not working by its own, it's on-chain governance, and there's some principles uh, that we don't need a representative, we don't need a central authority to take decisions, and that could be potentially the way through for IT-based democracy. Uh, so there's these new governance systems are, in my opinion, very interesting. Um, and so on on-chain governance, you will have the slides, I think my time is up, but uh, basically, um, these frameworks that exist now uh, bring some new principles of democracy, new voting principles, which are very interesting to dig into. So this is potentially the government on-chain, you know, the, the new way of voting in games, and uh, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much uh, for the interesting presentation, which has added a lot of new aspects to the discussion. Uh, partly there were also references to phenomena which have been mentioned in the first presentation, like technological uh, neutrality. But without further ado, I would like to call the third uh, speaker uh, to the stage. The third uh, speaker is uh, Michael uh, Kunz. Michael Kunz uh, got his law degree from the University of uh, Zurich, uh, and he's now partner uh, at MME Zurich, a law firm quite well known in the uh, crypto business uh, scene. Uh, Michael uh, Kunz has been become a partner of MME in 2017 and focuses his uh, practice uh, on uh, crypto uh, uh, business models, on uh, tokenization aspects, uh, on DAOs, and I guess we will learn now how to do it, how can we establish a DAO, since you do have a lot of experience in this field. The floor is yours. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very much, Professor Weber, for the kind introduction. Um, it's a true honor to be here today, and I, I say that for a particular reason. I, I met actually Sven Riva, I think it was one and a half years ago in Zurich, when Sven uh, gave a presentation on his PhD thesis on DAOs, I think it was, and even though I was working at that time already with a few DAOs, it was extremely inspiring to me because I left and I thought, wow, I realized uh, there's so much I have to learn, and um, I'm really excited to be here today, hoping you know, to give you an insight on the practice that we have established in family with our clients, and to be a little bit of the inspiration to you guys that Sven was for me one and a half years ago. So working with Emmy, as uh, Professor Weber has mentioned, has really allowed me to uh, work with some astounding projects. And as many of you may know, we have, or our team has helped up the Ethereum team to establish the foundation in 2014 in Zug. Um, also organized the first uh, ICO ever in 2015, and this obviously led a lot of projects to come to Switzerland and also to our doors. And um, I think, you know, we really have a, a very broad, you know, customer base, but I think for the purpose of this presentation here, a few projects that we've worked on that have been very interesting in this context are Bancor, which has um, launched the very first automated market maker and has a DAO. We have, uh, we're working with Curve, which is famously operated by the Curve DAO with one inch, a DeFi aggregator that um, also has um, its own governance token. And, and so when we started working with DAOs more often, it was funny because they came to us and usually came with two points, they said. They said, first, we need a liar, uh, legal wrapper. Second, they said, we need a foundation. And it's interesting because the first part really was, okay, I get it, because the, the, the legal wrapper was really floating around everywhere because people realized at one point that 
maybe it's not so safe after all to participate in DAOs because maybe you're gonna end up being you know, liable for some of the DAOs decisions. And the other thing was more surprising because um, I always thought that the crypto community is extremely um, innovative when it comes to products, but it has shown that they're not as innovative when it comes to corporate or structuring solutions. So since Ethereum has chosen a foundation and Maker has chosen a foundation or better a foundation company, um, you know, everybody says that's what we want to do because we want to actually walk in the same paths that others have already um, created for us. So um, my colleague has uh, already mentioned a few of the legal um, solutions or corporate solutions we have. I'm going to keep this very short. So in my view, I mean, I don't have to cooperate here because we haven't really worked with cooperatives much, but it's really a choice between a uh, commercial setup, a corporate setup where you're going to have a limited company on LLC, or you choose a foundation or an association. And so they have very different purposes. So the corporate setup really is used when you want to have, when it distribute dividends, because it's really the only setup in which you can do so. Um, and therefore really used for, you know, infrastructure projects, maybe some, you know, dApps um, that don't really want to have uh, a big um, owner ownership in their company. Foundations are very often chosen for layer one protocols because you give a promise to the users that if you develop on my protocol, I'm gonna still be around in 10 years and I'm gonna use all the money you give me now to make sure that it's only used for that purpose. So people don't buy Lamborghinis or other things. And last but not least, we have the association. I'm gonna focus my presentation later on a bit on the association because I do think it's a perfect setup or a perfect tool for many DAOs as um, Florian mentioned before. Now, when we work with our clients, we usually, we realize very early on that there's kind of like these three archetypes of relationships, because everybody said legal wrapper, but what we realized is they're not really wrapping anything. In contrast, what you actually have, you have a DAO and you have a legal entity, and so the question is always how are they related? What's the relationship between them? And so we realized that um, the first setup, as we call social signaling, is probably the most common one. You have a legal entity, a project that um, raises funds and then over time wants to decentralize. So they release their governance token and they tell members, this protocol is now yours, vote on it, make proposals and we're gonna implement. The reality often is that the lead remains with the legal entity and that has mainly to do with the fact that many of the decisions taken by the DAOs have to be implemented off chain, which means you need to have somebody who actually does it for you, which also means that that somebody has a veto right. And we have seen that very often that people say, look, the DAO may have voted on it, but in the end, we're on the hook the SEC is gonna go after us, we're not gonna do this. This obviously is great for the DAO because it gives them liability protection, but it doesn't give them any control or power, so obviously not a fantastic solution from a DAO's perspective. Now the second option in principal agent relationship, as we call it, is a bit different. There you have a native DAO that emerges out of the Web3 environment and then decides, we should have a legal entity to actually be able to act in the real world. And what happens there is that you often set up a company you have kind of a master services agreement with that company that basically does stuff for the DAO. It's kind of like the representative of the DAO. And, you know, among legal professionals, as we are, <laughs> I am aware that there's a limited enforceability in that contract, so it's not perfect, but, you know, it actually allows the DAO to kind of give some tasks to the legal entity, but stay in power. Which brings us to the legal wrapper. And I'm not a researcher, so I don't really know what other jurisdictions have to offer, but I would argue that Switzerland is one of few, if not the only jurisdiction that actually has a legal solution for really wrapping a DAO. And the reason why that is, is because in the other setups you see in the visualization, you actually have always this relationship, right? And the legal wrapper, you don't really have it because the, the, uh, the DAO itself is wrapped by the association. And the good thing about this is that actually it combines the best of both worlds, right? On the one hand, you do have the liability protection for the members because they actually have voting power. Well, no, actually. So they have voting power, they are in control, and they're also protected because the company shields um, the DAO members towards the outside. Now, when you talk about the association, we actually have um, established various different setups with our clients, and I would like to look at four specific solutions that we have created. The first two are, as we call like general options, because they're really just uh, variations of the first two, like the social signaling setup and the principal agent relationship. Um, starting with the advisory DAO. So as typical for the social signaling setups, the project, the company controls, you know, the team establishes the association, has um, very few members, but then they actually issue the governance token and allow people to participate. Now the twist here is that the DAO members have a choice. 
They can either just vote, as they used before, as you do in almost every other DAO, but they can also join the association. And the benefit of that is that you can actually catch the, um, the active members of the community, which is important because we do hear a lot about governance fatigue by a lot of DAOs. Very few people are actually active, but those that are active are the ones you don't want to be frustrated, so you actually want to get them on board. So this allows you to have a small team that is actually in the lead, and you can actually get those you know, talented minds that you meet in, in, the, in, the, in the ecosystem and um, don't limit the ownership or basically control to the founding members. Um, we do believe that that's a great solution for um, companies that want to increase community engagement and actually allow people to join the team. Mm -hmm. The principle down, on the other hand, is um, as the principal agent relationship suggests, it's that the DAO is in the lead and actually enters into, uh, so it establishes an association and um, then has this agreement with the association, hands over certain tasks to the association. And that's a very common setup when you say, you know, we want to have a bank account, we maybe want to have, you know, engage developers, we want them to be, like the developers to be able to have VAT compliant invoicing. But the difference here, again, the twist is that the DAO members, they cannot only um, vote on the DAO. Also there, they can join the association as a service provider and actually participate there as well. Now granted, that's only really interesting if the association has some discretionary power. But we see that often um, that these legal entities, they're not just used to funnel money, which would also be an a AML concern, but they actually have discretion as to who they want to hire and what they want to do and who they want to give grants to. And, um, and so therefore, it's often in the interest of the DAO members to say, I don't want to just vote on chain. I also want to be in the meetings, you know, when, when the other stuff is being discussed. And I think it's actually really recommended for two projects types. So first of all, those who have a service provider with a lot of discretion and actually say, look, it's not going away to power. You can join them, right? If you want to participate there too, you can. And the other thing which I think is very interesting is that it actually allows a solution for DAOs that want to you know, dissolve gradually over time. And we've seen that in the past that basically these DAOs kind of merge into the association over time, and in the end, what you have is just the association. Which brings me to the other two more specific options. And these two, you can only do with the association. And the reason is because the association, as I said, is the only entity that actually wraps the DAO. And so basically how you can do this is you can, on the one hand, you can say the DAO is gonna be a body of the association, or you can say the, the DAO and the association should actually be one and the same. Now the first option is really um, chosen by projects that say, look, we really wanna give our DAO members a good feeling about liability, but we also wanna give them true governance and control over certain aspects of the project. This can be, you know, grants. This can also be changing the fees in the DeFi protocol. Um, and it really is not anymore vetoed by the, by the association itself. Now, how does this work? So the project team establishes the association. It um, introduces then the DAO. It, it releases a governance token, introduces the, the DAO as a body in the association, which the association can do. So the association has uh, the, the members, basically the general assembly, as a mandatory body, it has a board as a mandatory body, and it can have all other bodies at once. And so one of the options would be the DAO, and then basically you can say the DAO really remains legally separated from the legal entity, even though it's wrapped. So the DAO has its own area of responsibility. It can organize itself. It can communicate the outcome of its votes. And if it's an on-chain activity, ideally it can execute as well. And the association remains externally liable for the activities of the body, which is essential we are aware that there are limitations you know, to that uh, protection, and obviously there's internal liability risks, but at least it allows them to be protected to a certain extent. And last but not least, I would like to talk a bit about the General Assembly DAO, which is really when you go all in. And the idea there really is to say, you know what, we actually want to have a DAO, and it should look like a DAO and work like a DAO, but it should be a legal entity. And how this works is that founding members establish the association and, um, but really draft the articles of, of association in a way that the DAO is truly honored or kind of taken uh, in consideration. So the first thing you do is you replace the general assembly that you normally have with the ballot initiative. There's something you can do, then you basically make a full replacement and you say, we're not gonna meet anymore physically in a center, but we actually move all governance on chain. So basically everything the general assembly does in its activity 
is moved on chain. Now you wonder who executes, so to that end you actually have not a board, ideally, because the board then again, you know, creates a bit more equal people that, you know, sit next to the DAO, but instead you hire an administrator that actually executes on a contractual relationship the decisions made by the association. Now one thing that is very important in that setup is how you treat token balances. Because we all heard about whales and about hostile takeovers and a lot of our clients are afraid that people actually come in, buy up all the tokens and they take control. So what we generally recommend here is you do have as a principle one person, one vote. This is not mandatory. If you have objectively justifiable reasons, you can actually deviate from that rule. And what we generally recommend is to use something called square root voting where the voting number of votes is the square root of the tokens you hold. Um, but there's various other ways how you can do this. We personally recommend this setup for projects that really want to remain decentralized, that want to give true control to the DAO, and that want to offer liability protection to the DAO members. Now, why doesn't everybody do this? Especially in the DeFi space, it's not necessarily recommended to do this because you end up having one legal entity. And that entity absolves all risks. And so if you're actually in violation of the AMLA or if you're in violation of the Collective Investment Schemes Act, you name it, that entity cannot hide anymore. So that's why it's really important to think through. And I do believe, you know, two takeaways for you today is that, at least in my opinion, I think Switzerland does offer enough legal entity types and structuring options to consider every single governance model there is. There may be things that you can't do just because it's against the law, but I don't think it's, it's gonna be a problem from a structuring perspective. Um, so there's really no need to go to the Cayman Islands or to go to British Virgin Islands. But that's my point, right? If, if people wanna do that, they, they're free to do so. But the other thing is also that the association, in my view, is the only or one of the only options to actually truly wrap the DAO. And um, yeah, which leaves me you know, a few parting words. So. Um, uh, as I said, you know, when we sit together with our clients, we really talk about projects first and leave the whole structure to the end. And I think that's a really important point also as a takeaway because I think many people are too focused on the structure itself, which I think should come uh, at the very end. That is it. Thank you. Thank you very much for this interesting uh, presentation. Um, it's uh, really an honor that we get uh, legal advice uh, free of charge, legal advice which we can apply uh, on uh, Monday. And I would like now to uh, open the discussion without saying any word. All three presenters are uh, already here and apparently they do get um, uh, microphones. Perhaps uh, just uh, as one bridging remark, uh, Florian Ducoma mentioned uh, that uh, um, K uh, technology. If you are interested in more details, recently an article in German language, I have to admit, was published in uh, Geskair by Boskrich and Hepp. Hepp is, by the way, a lawyer at uh, MME, so you can spend a lot of time in digging into this new uh, technology. Now I would like to uh, open the discussion. I would assume that you should wait for the microphone until you ask your question, since we do have um, online uh, participants, otherwise online participants do not hear your question, or otherwise eventually the presenters have to repeat uh, the question. Who would like to break the ice? Yes, Um, Anja von Rosenstiel, nice to meet you. Thank you very much for this very impressive uh, uh, presentations and run through the whole Swiss uh, yeah, regulatory and uh, private law landscape. So I was very intrigued by uh, pointing out the principles of um, technology neutral and same rules, same risks. And you uh, mentioned that between the lines that there's a discussion about staking and uh, aligning it to, to the t theme of DAO. Uh, so there is uh, token distribution, seed capital, but uh, the DAOs also need revenues, right? Um, so could you say something about these principles? Um, are they still uphold uh, in Switzerland? Um, FINMA's approach, perhaps not into the details, but about staking and then 
how it could affect also the DAO landscape. Thank you. Yeah, sure. Th thank you very much for um, this very interesting question. So yeah, I, uh, technology neutrality is a principle, and as Florian correctly mentioned, um, in practice it's not always the case. Um, so we, we, we see that there are some differences. And now with staking, you know, st the question of staking for everybody in the room who is maybe not, uh, not aware of that, but FINMA recently made um, a statement or, or some, some decision that uh, the, just staking, uh, as it was considered before, as not triggering any, uh, any banking license requirement, now in certain instances it does, so in very short terms. Now it's, it's a bit of a political question, in my view. Um, a lot of people have criticized the decision, a lot of people have said, well, legally speaking, it's probably correct. Um, so I think there is not really um, a, a miracle answer. We'll see if people challenge it. I've heard um, in the market that some people are trying to challenge it. So maybe in a few years we'll have a decision about it. But in the in the in the DAO space, it will certainly have in the DeFi especially uh, DeFi space. It will have implications because basically, if you if you do staking and you fulfill all the requirements set out by Finma, you are a bank. Uh, so and you cannot just operate like that so it it will limit a, a little bit um, what what DAOs can do in in Switzerland but it should be it shouldn't be overstated as well I think there are still ways to navigate around it yeah as far as uh, staking is concerned um, there's staking and staking if you stake in a node and you generate returns rewards by participating to the consensus this is something that is generally accepted as being a reward for participating to the security of the network, right? So this is not concerned by this new batch of uh, regulation. What is concerned, however, is more the staking pools, operating in a centralized way, a staking pool, getting the rewards, and sharing that with the token holders, right? So again, it's always a matter of centralization the way through for me is to have decentralized staking pools, decentralizing the key. There's technology out there called distributed validation technology, and you can actually just change the paradigm of having regulators coming and regulating as a bank. And the same as I mentioned between Ethereum and Bitcoin, you just go back to the basics. You go into the decentralization uh, paradigm and, and, and that is a way through, I guess, uh, this, will, this will be discussed a lot in the coming months, but uh, this, is, this is a way through. And, and also for token issuance, if you think about it, the regulator has used a centralized approach saying, you regulate the association, you regulate the foundation, the one that actually controls the smart contract. That's an Ethereum-based approach. If you think that the DGF, can be the issuer of the token. There's no one issuer to be regulated. It's just make sure that the token is, is properly a utility token, and then you can e issue it in a decentralized way without too much of a regulatory burden. So I think it all goes down now to the qualification of the token. Your question is, if you stake, you lock the tokens, you get rewards with that proper technology uh, you know, in the background to secure the network, that, will, that is likely to be qualified as a security. And also with NFTs. We had some position of FINMA with NFTs. If you keep the NFT giving you access to greater experiences or, or more things, it's considered to be like in GameFi, Game for example, considered to be a security token. So, yeah, this is more locking, and this is more from a security token perspective that there's some risks, and the answer on the decentralization part is, is uh, for me, the way through.
So I'm uh, Jeff Strenad uh, from Stanford. And I had a question about, for Michael primarily, but also the other participants maybe. And it's about the um, square root voting. Um, so square root voting, it comes out of public good uh, dis you know, distribution. It works well for that. Questionable whether it works well for some of these other applications. But there's a big problem that involves a legal problem too, which is a civil attack. So I'm a big entity. I'm going to buy the smallest possible quantity of each token. I'm gonna, but I'm going to do that a million times. We're going to take the square root of that. You can take Ethereum. You buy one way, which is 10 to the minus 18th F. Uh, you can take over Ethereum for like 200 to $400. You can do a back envelope computation. So what do we have to do to respond to that legally? We'd have to identify, be able to identify token holders and be able to tell when there's a civil attack. And that, would have, that could have a disastrous effect on these attempted um, structures. So that, that's my question is whether, what you think about that problem. Thank you very much. I think that's a, can you hear me? <clears throat> I think it's a really good question. And um, look, personally, I am a big supporter of the one person, one vote setup, because I do believe that the, the problem that you, that you mainly see is really this governance fatigue and this frustration that people have that they're just outvoted by others, right? And you don't really inspire participation by seeing somebody else has just 10 times as many votes as you. And that is square root, you know, solution is, is one solution that you can, in my view, and as you pointed out, only really employ when you actually have a certain control over the membership application process and you do require members to identify it to a certain extent. Um, but yeah, it's an absolutely fair point. If I just shortly, um, I think the the cooperative um, structure is by nature one person, one vote. So this is a structure for that that responds to, to, to this concern. And also what I like with the cooperative structure is that by law, the, the, the shares are not um, securities, right? It, it can't be. So you, c you cannot wrap that into a, 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 a security. So that, that could answer uh, one of the problem with civil attacks and, and, and things like that in terms of governance. But you, you need to make sure that the, the value will be in the governance tokens and not in the proceeds, you know, as I mentioned in my example, because that doesn't fit. But if the value is in the governance token, and the actual vote is one person, one vote, then that could make sense. I just have one second. It's, it's always, you know, the, this principle, uh, when you go with decentralization, you cannot keep control, right? So it's, it's always a balance to strike whether you, you want to keep control as a founder, uh, as founding members, uh, or you want to completely like release that there are ways around it if you look it's quite interesting actually you can you, you can find inspirations in the financial sector because there are a lot of tools that allow you to to, to, to keep control but I think it's it's maybe not possible to, to 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 have a perfect solution where you have a decentralized system with no liability for you uh, and still maintain control Thank you very much. Next uh, question, well, please. I, I think we have a question online um, from Ms. Masala. What happens when the DAO members have decision-making powers concerning the management of the assets? There is no third party management is there. Anyone? Would you like to take it, Michael? Yeah, I mean, it's a, again, another very good question is uh, also what Florian pointed out about the Collective Investment Schemes Act, that if you actually have, so one of the requirements you need to have a third party asset manager. And so the question is, does that actually qualify as a third party? You know, I, I, I would like to give over to Florian to hear his views, but um, I personally think that if you put money into a, a smart contract and you have predefined rules how it's going to be used, you don't have a, a problem. I think the problem arises then when you have a decentralized governance on how the funds are used, and that can change. So let's assume you put one ETH in a smart contract, and the smart contract says, we're going to use it for liquid staking, you know, on Rocket Pool. But then actually, you go to vacation, you come back, and you realize, oh, there was a vote. You know, they changed how the money is used. And I think that's a really big problem. That is actually when the Collective Investment Schemes Act is triggered. But 
to figure out whether the vote was taken in Switzerland or whether Swiss law applies is a different question. Yeah, I think one of, one of the focus of, of FINMA was always to, to look at um, how you know, the governance framework can control the assets uh, to avoid rug pools and to avoid people taking control over, over the underlying assets. So I believe if you have a DAO that is really focused on govern governance and the, the assets are not, you know, decided on the, on the governance uh, framework, uh, you are safer. And, and also, what I wanted to mention, the association framework um, is, is, is indeed a good one, but it's a centralizing factor. So if the association actually controls the asset, it, it's in the association, yeah, it's, it should not be a third-party management. If it's outside and you have third-party, you know, delegation that control the smart contract or control the asset indirectly, that's also going to be qualified as, as potentially a, a collective investment scheme. So you need to be careful there. Um, what we did with the association model is the association develops the, the governance protocol, the governance interface, makes it available. That's the whole purpose of the association. Can update it, can you know, um, uh, maintain it. But then the, the decentralized governance framework is outside of the association and, and all the decisions which do not relate actually to the tokens themselves are taken by the distributed governance framework, which is not in the association, but using the protocol made available by the association. That might be a way to mitigate the risk as well. There's, no, there's not one model, it depends on the project. But this is a setup that, in my opinion, uh, is, is actually working at the moment, and Switzerland is a good place for that. Thank you very much for the next uh, question. Please go ahead, Pinar. Okay, thank you very much uh, for the speeches. Uh, I was just wondering, when a company or when a group of people who have a project um, that could be realized by a DAO uh, has several options to start their business in the USA or maybe come to countries who are crypto friendly like Switzerland, how do they make the decision? I mean, according to you, what would be the benefits of doing it? And I mean, you have mentioned the pros of Switzerland, but compared to other um, jurisdictions that have regulated DAOs like the USA, uh, why would the companies come to S Switzerland? Like instead of establishing as an LLC in the US, uh, what would be the benefits of Switzerland in your opinion? Thank you, thank you very much for this question. Uh, taxes? <laughs> no, S -s seriously, th that's taxes for the U.S. Uh, especially. A lot of uh, our clients have this doubt, uh, as I mentioned in my slides, Wyoming or Switzerland. Th that's the main question today, I think, in practice. And seriously, taxes and the U.S. jurisdiction is very scary for for members. So it's easy to set up in the U.S. You can you have your your legal framework in uh, in Wyoming, which is quite clear although certain provisions are, are quite, yeah, maybe, maybe difficult. Typically in Wyoming, I think if you don't um, make any, any votes uh, during one year, your DAO just disappears. Uh, so, that's, so there are th those small things that influence the decision, but mainly people are just scared that they end up with SEC proceedings if they issue any product um, and if they have US investors, it's, it's, it's really complicated. That's why people, I think, tend to rather choose offshore jurisdictions, which are completely, I mean, risk-free in that respect, almost risk-free. And Switzerland, I think it strikes a good balance between being like lightly regulated with still room to maneuver and while not having all those huge risks like SEC enforcement. I don't know what you guys have experienced. I would like to add up on that. I think um, that's a very good point because having a solution for DAOs in Wyoming is a good puzzle piece, right? But it's not enough, right? In the end, it really depends what you're going to do. If you're going to do something that the SEC, if you're going to issue any type of token, literally, then you already are at risk, right, from being enforced. Taxes are not attractive, and I do think that 
that's really the big, and I really like that how you presented it today um, in that in that fashion. Because even with Mika is coming along, we do see you know that the European Union is embracing you know blockchain technology, but we have yet to see how this is actually going to play out in the individual countries. You know, are the tax authorities going to play along? Are you know are are there going to be enough people to actually work in these uh, protocols? Is there the know-how? Are the banks going to be willing to play along? And so I do think Switzerland really has the package that makes a difference. Um, and I think that's the that's the biggest plus. Well, um. we I think we have another question online. If not explicit choice of law is made, it is difficult to locate DAO. What is the best way to locate DAO since the exact jurisdiction find applicable law on it? Well, thank you for this very private international law question. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's not for me; it's for you. You are the stars. I'm not sure I'm going to take it, but I just wanted to... to there, there's an irony in, in this topic because the purpose of this decentralization is not to be located in a jurisdiction, is to be located in the Web3, right? So that's, that's my question in my presentation. Are we now at a stage where we don't need countries to uh, actually uh, take decisions, but we can have an IT-based democracy? And that would be like over the, the borders, right? So uh, now the, our clients, they want to have a regulatory um, certainty. They want to have a jurisdiction to attach to. They want to be able to invoice. They want, they, so we need to have now a legal wrapper and that, that makes a lot of sense. But I think ultimately, it should, it's not in the spirit of, of this whole concept, and uh, and I guess the works of uh, Professor Guillaume on the topic of where do we um, w regulate, where do we go enforce the decisions, where do we go to court, is extremely interesting because, well, even if you have like a, a, a limited uh, contract, uh, a partnership agreement, you need to have all the people participating to the DAO to be able to enforce a decision, which is technically impossible, right, if people are all around the world. So th these questions are very theoretic and very interesting, but in practice, extremely difficult to, to answer, actually. So I'm not sure I, I answered your question, and I, I'm not <laughs> you know, trying to do it, but just give you some insight. Thank you. Thank you very much. Just a quick note on that uh, from a lawyer's perspective, because this question is theoretical. But if you ask a lawyer, it's a bit different, because why would we actually ask that question? There are two reasons. The first one is a regulator asking that question if they want to enforce. So they will find the jurisdiction. And if it's global, they, they will just find some anchor and they will apply it in order to do an enforcement and the second one is in case of litigation so here the answer is also very practical you follow the money you identify the members you see where the money is and you just go there and you try to attract and to find jurisdiction if i uh, look at the swiss uh, watch i think i uh, can allow for a very last uh, question um, over there please yeah. go ahead thank you uh, this has been very interesting um, I'm really curious to understand why more companies don't use, or DAOs don't use, the cooperative model in Switzerland. Uh, you talked about it briefly. Um, associations and foundations both have the problem of not being able to distribute, um, let's say, profits, whereas the cooperative has that at least partially, and in ultimately, in practice, the value accrues to the token. In your opinion, why is that not used uh, by, by, by DAOs at the moment, is it? That was, I, I'm not sure I heard it correctly. It's about the cooperative or the corporations? Why do people don't use cooper, co co cooperation? The, the cooperative model. Sorry, is this not working well? <laughs> okay, okay. Um, so why, given that uh, DAOs as associations and foundations, none, none of those models can distribute profits, and ultimately it seems to come down to the value accruing to the token, why are people not using the cooperative model at the moment, given that it is interesting from some perspectives? Um, some, some are trying to, to use this model. Um, it's, it's coming. So we had, we had some clients doing that. You need to have seven members to incorporate, and you need to have legalized and apostille signatures. So in terms of incorporation, 
you need to have people that are dedicated, to, if they are all over, all over the world, to send all the legal documents. It's just a practical question to set up. It's not like that, like an association, it's much easier. So if you go over this administrative, you know, setup burden, uh, the model works pretty, pretty well, in my opinion. Uh, but mostly for when the value is on the governance token, and that works pretty well for gaming. Um, when you want to have like a DeFi protocol run by a cooperative or a mining pool, it's it's less practical. But yeah, but we see that emerging actually this this model. Yeah. So to clarify, I've. I've we have a DAO ourselves, and we went with the association, and we originally had thought maybe the cooperative was interesting, and we kind of heard this sort of like, don't go there, it's too complicated. So just wondering if there's any thoughts on why they would have said that. I mean, we have the members, and, and there was a lot of paperwork involved anyway, so is it really more complicated than the association? Or Not that much, not that much. I don't think it should be a blocking factor. Um, and I, also what I thought interesting with the, this model is that you can have like, you know, uh, Migro, you can have a, a federation of cooperatives. Uh, so um, it's, it's, you can have like the federation that issues the token and then it's used in all the cooperatives be, below. Uh, so, it, I mean, there's some legal engineering, uh, it's true, but, uh, but it's an int interesting model. Thank you. So one last question online. Token holders, DAO members who can vote on proposals and benefit of some rewards could be considered as sort of shareholders of DAO? Question mark. Michael, that's for you. Yeah, I mean, I guess, yes, you know, I guess, I mean, that's the whole idea, right? I mean, what, is a, what does a shareholder do, right? They have financial rights and they have participation rights, and that is pretty much it. But I do think what is a, a question we haven't really talked about, and I think it's also interesting from a tax perspective, it surprised me that it hasn't arisen more often, who owns the money, right? Who is actually the legal owner of you know, the treasury assets? And if you look around in most DAOs, if you actually had a vote and say, do you actually believe that you are co-owner of the money and are you gonna be willing to actually tax, you know, pay taxes on that money as a wealth tax? They would say, no, 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 that's not my money, that's the project's money. I may have actually right to participate in it, but I cannot really dissolve and just take out. And you see this whenever this actually does happen in the community, there's a huge outcry because people say that is not what we wanted to do. This was not a vehicle to make everybody rich. This is a vehicle to actually serve a purpose. And actually just dissolving it and taking the money out, as it does happen, you know, sadly sometimes, actually shows that most people don't see it like a share. Personally, I don't know any uh, corporation that rewards shareholders for vo for voting at the general meeting. That's not something that is <laughs> qualifying as a shareholder to be rewarded for voting. But in Web3, what we see emerging is more and more like having rewards for participating in the votes. And I think this is a great way to actually incentivize people to participate, to give their opinion. And that's also a loophole to reward without paying sharehold, shareholders or without having dividends payments. Or, but tax-wise, I don't know how it qualifies. I'm not a tax lawyer. But the, the term shareholder could be a little bit dangerous because it brings shareholder close to the taxonomy of asset token. And I would rather recommend not to use the term shareholder. Just um, just completing what we said. So in a corporation, it's even worse than in DAOs because shareholders are not uh, remunerated for voting. They are remunerated for doing nothing, right? When you're a shareholder, you don't need to do anything and you receive dividends. Uh, so, so, so here at least we have a difference. But I just wanted to point out something that now I think in the next few months or years in Switzerland, we might, and that comes a bit um, uh, along your question um, uh, around the cooperative, but I think corporate structures will see some DAO uh, features in the future. Now that we have since, since this year, the possibility to do general assemblies completely online, we could see models and I think people are working um, on it and we might see new models and maybe that, that, will, that will change a bit um, the, the, the Swiss landscape on that respect. Okay. Thank you uh, very much.
despite this very interesting discussion looking uh, at the watch, I need to close now this uh, session. I would like to thank you for the very active uh, participation leading to the result that I did not have the chance to ask any of my questions. But in particular, uh, I would like to close this session by a big round of applause to the uh, three outstanding presenters. Thank you very much and please come.